First Peter chapter 3 is where we're at. The title of my message is, The Order is Everything. The Order is Everything. I love this passage of scripture from 1 Peter 3. It starts in verse 13, and we're going to read to verse 16. Like, as though it was arbitrary and not planned from last Monday. Uh, it's like pretending, right? Verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. He's quoting from Isaiah. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. God, would you speak something special and fresh and precious to our hearts. Let it be timely, whether we realize we need it right now or not, because we're aware that we don't quite know what we need to hear. The, the word that jumps out to us the most may be the least relevant to us a month from now as situations unfold. So we trust you to speak to our hearts. And we want to hear what you have to say to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jenny and I were traveling a while back, and we ended up in a hotel, and it was leg day. And uh, by that, of course, I mean like my self-designated leg day. It wasn't like that's international leg day, right? I realized, realized you might have your own leg day. For me, it was the day of the week where I do the, unnecess the, 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 the necessary but unpleasant, the necessary but unpleasant deed that is leg day, right? Now, you're like, why don't you just skip leg day, right? Let me tell you, in my head, there are, there's always, almost always a little voice saying, you should skip leg day. Like right now, it's not leg day, but it's already planning out its speech for, <laughs> for leg day. But, but the way I look at it, every time I do it, I get to walk away and go, well, that's done for a week, and not think about it, right? So I'm like, that's behind me. Because you, you, it's, it's worthless to do all the other muscles that you like to do if you're not doing leg day, because the biggest muscles in your body happen to be connected to your posterior chain. And so if you're like, no, I just like biceps, right? You actually are going to build bigger biceps if you're working leg day, because of the fact that as your glutes and your hamstrings all the way up to your traps, I mean, the largest muscle group in your body goes from your neck to the bottom of your heels, and it's going to require new growth hormone when it's agitated. And the rest of your body, as an un unintended consequence, is going to get the benefit of all that growth hormone. So when you work your biceps on Thursday, they're going to be going, hey, thanks, legs, for all that growth hormone that's just floating around. And it's like Yoinkovich Chomofsky, right? That's what your biceps are saying when they're just grabbing, right? Just Yoinkovich Chomofsky. That's what they say. Yoink, yoink. They just, it's, it's, a, it's shortened when it's yoink. It's longer when it's Yoinkovich Chomofsky. That's, that's just how they steal the growth hormone from your blood, right? And so your biceps are going to have an easier time uh, working themselves out because of what you're doing on this other side over here. It's kind of like church. When you're, when you're doing this in here, when you're, when you're seeking God in here, when it comes to some other difficult thing on Tuesday, you're going to get the benefit out of something you did the day before. That you're going you're to get the benefit. It's still in your blood. When we, when we get into the scripture and we study God and we, we worship him, it's why it's so important. We come together. We lift up our hands and we, we shout and we clap and we praise him, whether we feel like it or not, because Thursday's coming. And Thursday's going to be challenging. And there's going to be that difficult meeting. And there's going to be that coworker with bad breath. And there's going to be that situation where you're just like, ah. And you're going to have the unintended consequence of something you did earlier in the week still floating around in your blood that's going to help you grow in that way that you need to. And so for me, leg day is unpleasant, and I don't like it. And it sometimes makes me nauseous, and I get a little bit like faint. And I don't, I don't, I don't like squatting. I don't like bending down. I, 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 I'm not very flexible. But leg day is, to me, unskippable, all right? And, and here's the other reason why, because you asked. Um, <laughs> I, I hate nothing on earth more than the three days after leg day after you skipped it for a couple weeks. Well, that's the worst. 
Well, that's just unpleasant, where you, where you kind of waddle up and down stairs like a constipated horseback rider who's never ridden a horse before. You're like, oh, this is awful. I don't like anything. And I, I'm, I'm particularly prone to Charlie horses. I don't know if I don't get enough electrolytes or I need a banana or what. But, but I feel like when, I, when I'm recovering from sore legs, I'm just getting Charlie horses in bed all the time. You know the kind that make you feel like you're exercising a demon just for about seven seconds? And you're like, oh, oh, what are my toes doing? Make them stop. Anybody with me? Am I all alone up here? Don't like that feeling. And so I keep leg day alive, if only so I don't have to have a leg day where there hasn't been one in a while. And so uh, that's, that's just me. Uh, so I get to this, this gym, and I'm sizing up the equipment. And, 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 and I see you know, the leg extension machine. I know that works the hamstrings. And so I'm kind of making my way over there. And, and I get all situated up in it and get it all adjusted just right. And, and I go to, to do it, and there's, there is no extension, there's no extending of the legs. I mean, this thing is, is stuck. I'm like, is there a pin in here? I don't know. It, I've never seen this particular machine. It had like a, it almost looked like a leather belt like you'd have in your car, like a serpentine belt. I didn't quite understand that. And a lot of unnecessary pulleys were involved. There wasn't cables. And I, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was in the South, so I just figured it's just how they do it in the South or whatever. And <laughs> like, they don't, they don't have cables yet, but they'll, they'll get there, right? And, and, uh, and so I see a lady at the desk with some towels behind her, uh, in front of her. She's sitting behind the desk. There's towels all over it. And I, I caught her eye, kind of struggling. Like she watched me struggle for a good a minute before she caught my eye. And I'm, I, I went like, you know, like the, hey, how, I'm not doing so good over here. How, how, how's it going with all those towels? Are they heavy? Like, what's happening? And she said, can I help you? I go, is this machine broken? She goes, no. I go, oh. Because it isn't working. That's what I said. Because <laughs> it isn't working. And she went, <clears throat> I think it's working fine. I go, well, it's not extending my hamstrings. And, uh, and she, uh, she gets up, comes over. And I, I hopped up. She goes, in my 10 years in the fitness industry, I have never seen one of these machines break. I go, well, you're about to, honey, because this one. <laughs> This one's not working. And uh, I, you know, I, I would have been fine with her figuring it out. But she sits down. She does the exact same things I spent the last minute doing, pulling and tugging. And well, this should just go up here. I'm like, I know. I know it should. It shouldn't it. But it isn't. <laughs> and then she finally goes, well, I'll be. It's broken. <laughs> I said, you don't say. But then she gets really excited. I had not seen such passion. Am I lying, Jennifer? She goes, she goes, I can use my sign. And she runs off to her towel-laden desk, opens a drawer, and produces a laminated piece of 8 and a half by 11 paper that says, with like a sick icon, like a gym sick icon, like a thermometer sticking out of the, uh, the gym, the weight's mouth. She, she, and it says under it, out of order. And she tapes it to the front of the leg extension machine and goes, there. And then she scurries off. I'm like, what do you mean there? You didn't solve anything. I'm st I'm, my hamstrings are still not working. I need to extend something, or I'm, I'm, my 30 minutes is almost up here. And, <sighs> and I'm just sitting there looking at that sign, out of order. Sad little machine. <laughs> out of order. How did it run out of order? Get it? Like it had order, but then it ran out of it. Like it was like, oh, I'm all fresh out of order. Like, do you have any order I could borrow? You have, you have five orders? I don't have any order. That little machine, out of order. I'm like, why did we say that? Out of order. So I Googled it. And uh, turns out we have the British to thank for this. So now I'm in this, I realize the irony. I'm in the South researching about how those in England uh, have infected our culture with their weird phraseology. I'm not even owning it. Like, we came from England. I get it. But uh, the phrase out of order comes from the House of Parliament, where there was a uh, prearranged list of the order in which members of parliament, from now on it'll be MP for short, uh, the MPs are given a spot in which they are allowed to speak. And at any point, should an MP be unable to resist the urge and just break out and begin talking, he is, in fact, out of order. And if he's out of order, immediately the rest of the MPs can begin shouting him down. And for the rest of the time, anything he says while out of order, the scribe is not to take down. Nothing he says is to be taken down. 
and he's to be shouted down. So in, in England, in the parliament, it's unlike our church, right? Where when he's doing bad, they shout him down. And, and here, we're, you're supposed to shout me down when I'm doing good, right? <laughs> and, and, and you're like, we'll do good, and we will. All right, I get it. <laughs> Tough crowd. So, so, so I, I got to thinking, like, what a funny thing that he was literally speaking out of order. But it just sort of has trickled down into our language as being what we describe a vending machine or, or, or a water fountain or a, or a refrigerator or an oven when, when it's, when it's not, act, not acting properly, when it's not working at all, when it's faulty, and when it's broken. We just say it's out of order. Order, order is everything. The order is everything. And of course, then it began to cause me to, to begin to think about how many situations in life order is crucial. Areas where it's not just about having the right things, the right ingredients, the right elements, but it's all about the sequence of those things. Now, of course, in, in, in addition, it's not that way. You can move stuff around, baby. I love that. Don't you love that? Just two plus two. Woo! Two plus two. Woo! Those are different twos, right? I, I moved them around while you weren't paying attention. Right? Or multiplicate. It doesn't really matter, right? But I didn't like math once the sequence was crucial. I don't like it once, you know, things, I don't like the formula stuff. I don't like the letter stuff, right? But, but, but the reality is, in, in many areas of life, it does matter greatly what, what comes before what and what comes after what. Like, OK, here's, here's the sequence, right? Let's pretend uh, you're in a restaurant, and I'm cooking your food. And I have to go to the bathroom. Do you care what order things happen in? Yes. I think you do. It should go like this. Levi goes to the bathroom. Levi washes his hands. Levi proceeds with cooking your food, right? Anybody with me? Uh, we're praying to God that that is exactly how it goes behind the scenes at every restaurant. There's a, you don't tell me you don't have faith. You have faith every time you go out to eat. <laughs> we're rethinking the decision to go out to eat, right? God created the world. What did that person in Taco Bell do? I don't know. I can, no, I can have faith. I can, all of a sudden, faith makes much more sense. It is, it is becoming more rational by the moment. So in, in, in that situation, of course, we would say, man, or, the order is everything. How about in, um, in a list of presidents, right? Like, here's a, here's a list of presidents. You go, what is, what is this list right here? This, this is a list of, of United States presidents. And if this was on a test in your civics class, and you were told, we, we need a list of four of the first presidents, the four first presidents, let's, let's say the question was, is the four first presidents we ever had. You'd be correct if this was what you wrote down, unless they had to be in order, in which case you'd be wrong. Because Madison was our fourth, and Adams was the second. But Jefferson and Washington, you can stay. <laughs> so the order in this situation would, in fact, be the difference between you being right and you being wrong. Or, or I got to thinking about how when you, when you get on an airplane, you're, you're hoping everything's by the book. You don't want any loosey-goosey, let's just figure it out. That's why I don't like it when the flight's delayed and they go, you know, we're going to make up some time in the air. I'm like, you could do that? Like, like, that's, like that, what, now all of a sudden, everything's just, I'm going to try to go faster? Why didn't you do that from the beginning? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm going to make some time up in the air. Out of what? <laughs> but you want the order to be exactly the same every single time. You want it to be your taking off, your climbing, the cruising, then the gradual descent, and then eventually landing. That's how you want it to go. Like, you, want, you want it to be rigid. That's the thing. Because cruising must not come before ascending. You don't just, we're going to take off a little bit, and then we're just going to cruise really fast. What if it's a mountain? That's why we're going at 30,000 feet or 38,000 feet. We need a real good ascent before we level off and cruise. <laughs> you also don't want the plane landing before the descent. You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be bad. We don't want the plane touching the earth until the gradual descent. The order is what? Everything. How about in spelling? How about in spelling? Like, if, if you have a spelling contest, like, spell Santa. Well, yeah, it's good. Well, the same exact letters could be. Some of you are like, I, I've been saying that for years. You chill out, OK? <laughs> but you're like, voot, voot. Same letters, completely different outcome. 
order is when it comes to apologizing. I wrote an apology out here. Look at this. This is, this is a version of an apology. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. But you hurt my feelings. That is a terrible apology. <laughs> because it leaves, really, really when I heard this, this changed my life, everything after the butt is what you really mean. Yeah. So you got to get your butt out of it. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. But you hurt my feelings. Because you leave them with the fault resting squarely on them. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's actually technically more your fault, since you're asking. That's a bad apology. Now, exactly the same ingredients. Let's just, you hurt my feelings. And that's an important element. But I shouldn't have said that. No matter what you did, I still had a choice. And what I did was wrong. I'm not excusing your wrong. I'm just owning mine. I shouldn't have said that. Therefore, we're leaving you with this final thought. I'm sorry. That's a good apology. The order is? Everything. See how often this comes into play? My favorite example I thought of was in just forming a sentence, right? The whole meaning of a story. So if you were telling a story, the whole meaning of the sentence could completely and drastically change. Like, like look at this sentence right here. Randall ate his candy and talked to his mom. Good day for Randall. We flip stuff around a little bit. It's different, man. It's different. <laughs> now you got a cannibal talking to his butterfinger. I mean, that's, we can't have that, Randall. Like, what, what is I have so many questions about Randall. What is he saying to his candy? She had it coming. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's weird. I told that to my kids as I was studying, and they all laughed so hard. So hard. And they got my sense of humor, I think. Randall. Eat the candy, Randall. <laughs> What's order? The order is everything. everything. The sequence is everything. We don't eat the pork before it goes into the oven. You skip steps on a recipe. That's trichinosis. I did all the steps, just not in the right order. That's a problem. Similarly, there's an order to the universe. Ecclesiastes says that to everything, there's a season in this world, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. In verse 11, if you skip ahead in that chapter that's famous from weddings and all the rest, it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. This verse was on Jenny and I's wedding invitation. <laughs> he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The, this text is saying is that when God made the world, he put certain laws into place. And to fight against it would be foolish. Or as Paul would later put it in the book of Romans, echoing the same exact thought, when you go against the grain, you get splinters. So God put a grain in. There's a rhythm in. There's an order in. It's always going to be seed time and then harvest. And you got you to get the timing right. It's like the giant jump rope goes around and around and around. You can keep building your sandcastle down at the edge of the sea and getting ticked when uh, the wave takes it out. Or you can go up shore about 15 yards, and it's going to be all right. This is, this is the person who is, is angry that they're in debt, but they, they keep spending more than they make. Frustrated, they don't fit into their you know college clothes, but eating unhealthy. I mean, you, you, there's, there's a rhythm to how this works. You fight against gravity every time you lose. It's amazing how this works. The Bible's saying there's there's that God put certain things into place. There's an order to it. There's there's laws to it. There's cause and effect to how He built the world. And in our lives, listen to me. In our lives, things end up out of order when you don't do them in the right order. Things end up out of order when you don't do them in the right order. And we could give plenty of examples about this. Uh, but what I like is how Peter basically shows us that there are certain things that if we do, we can, we can actually have a predictable outcome. 
Notice how in, in, in verse 13, he, he says, and this is a truism, this is an axiom. Peter is writing much like the author of the Proverbs writes, where this is generalities that are going to be true in most occasions because of how God built the, wor- built the world. Raise your child up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from you. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of the land, and your barns will be full, and your wine vats will overflow with new wine. These are truisms. This is just how, how God built the world, right? And what does he say in verse 13? He says, who's going to harm you if you're, ever, if you're eager to do good? Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? He's talking to people who have uh, their citizenship in heaven, but their feet still on this earth. That's us. And he's telling us what we should do and what we should not do. And I, I think the, the tension is, is that sometimes Christians, with our hearts in heaven, do a bad job of living here on earth. Because we're just so eager to go. Man, just give me that rapture. Man, I just read that Left Behind book. Can't wait. Right? Got my, got my uh, tribulation prep kit in case I was wrong about my eschatology. I, uh, I've been stockpiling ammo. I'm good to go. But man, I just can't wait to get out of this dirty world. Oh, all these sinners. Oh, it's getting worse and worse. Oh, I heard what they're teaching in the school systems, man. Can't wait to get to heaven. This creepy old world. This creepy old world full of people that Jesus died to save. Yeah. That God has a plan for, that God wants to redeem, that God wants to save, that God wants to touch <laughs> on a planet that he's going to use as a seed to refashion into the, the new world. So God cares for this world. And our, our, our love for God, if it leads to a hate for the people that he died for, things aren't going right. Yeah. So how do we live with our, our hearts set in heaven, but living beautifully with our feet on this earth? And he goes, hey. Just so you know, it's going to go better for you if, you if you live eager to do good. Why don't you bless this world? Why don't you live a life that's, that's beautiful, that, that would cause people around you, coworkers around you, people who don't know Jesus who live around you? As you mix with unbelievers, he used that phrase. As you mix with unbelievers, live in a way that they're going to want the faith that you got. And if you do that, look, a lot of times the trouble's going to be gone because who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? If you are building a phenomenal business and employing lots of people and being a phenomenal addition to the community you live in and flourishing and and vibrant and caring and kind, and if if we're living as Jesus followers like we should, the day that this church dies, every city that we have a presence in should collectively weep because they realize a powerhouse for good was just taken out. That, that we're, we're so just giving and caring and a blessing and, and helping and kind and loving and bumping shoulders with people who don't believe like we believe, but we love them just the same. And that we're showing up for work regardless of what environment it is, be it the, the most corrupt, depraved uh, f- people live, working in that industry or, or whatever the case. If, if Paul could tell us, live under Caesar, Nero himself, but do so with a wonderful spirit, praying for the king, submitted to the king. I mean, think about the, the, the places the gospel should go. The film industry, for sure. Aerospace, absolutely. Medical and, 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 and technological sectors. Every place that has people, Jesus followers should feel called to, to show up and punch in. If there's people there, let's report for duty there. And let's not be known for our Jesus clothing and our verses that adorn our cubicles, but doing a phenomenal job first and foremost, above and beyond, with excellence and integrity, with character and care, that we would be promotable because there's something different about us. Because we're eager to do good, zealous for, for doing a good job, uh, and, and that your, your wages are to you uh, what's being paid for you to go above and beyond. That's just a starting point. And that everyone just wants to have the shift next to you. I think about, again, Daniel. The Bible says a different spirit was in Daniel. And so corrupt, perverse king after corrupt, perverse king kept promoting him. Because man, that guy, no one does the job like Daniel does. Daniel gets stuff done. And that, that they, 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 they didn't believe like Daniel believed, but they wanted to be around Daniel. And that's how, who's going to harm you if you're, because you know, at the end of the day, people are pragmatic and, and selfishly motivated. All of us are. When I say people, I mean me. <laughs> that's what I meant. I meant me. I mean, I'm selfishly motivated and pragmatic. And we want to be around people who are like that. People who give, not take. People who are just always, the person who's always got gum and is like, you want gum? I'm like, I like you. You have gum. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, be, be the person with a pack of gum. 
Who's going to harm you? Check this out. Passion protects is our first takeaway truth. I only got two today. Passion protects. He's saying, you live that way. There's a protection built in. Because of how God built this world, there's just going to be like a built-in sort of force field, nine times out of 10, that's just going to protect you in many instances because people are going to want to have dealings with you. And, and when they see how great of a job you do, that you under-promise and, and over-deliver, that you're always looking for ways to add value and surprise and delight. And you're kind and you care and you notice little things. And you're like, man, who, who are you? Who the heck are you? The funny thing to me, though, is that Peter was writing these things to people whose lives were going terribly. And they were doing good, but life was really bad. And that's the funniest part to me. He's like, who's going to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? And they're like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, we are having people harm us. <laughs> because what, that which is a truism, of course, has exceptions. And they were living in those exceptions. You ever feel like you're, like, you're the exception to the rule a little bit? Nine times out of 10, it should go this way. It's not going that way for me. Awesome. <laughs> Why do it, we at times do good, but get treated bad? Here's why. Because there are people that are cruel. Cruel people. There are people who, like Michael Caine, the actor who played Alfred in The Dark Knight. Yes, I'm quoting Batman in church. Sue me. Um, he said, there are, there are some people who just want to watch the world burn. And there are just some people who have gone through things and they've been jaded and they just, they've, they've, they've sown to the flesh. They're, just, they're not following God's voice. They're, they're definitely dark, not light. And they're, gonna, they're just going to be cruel. Some people, they can't be reasoned with. They can't. They can't they, and, and we'll pray for God to reach those people. There are, let's just accept there are people out there like, man, nothing, no, nothing's ever enough. Doesn't really matter. And they're, they're just, man, God bless them. There are also people that are just clumsy. And they're hurting you, but they didn't mean to. And they just didn't know. They're just a wrecking ball. Just You're like, man, that hurts. <laughs> what? Of being around you. But they're like, well, I didn't even notice. Didn't even, didn't even notice. And, and probably between those two, there's, there's all sorts of different things. But we have to put some of this on us. We're also, at times, even though we're doing good, we're going we're gonna to experience things that are bad just because we were clueless. We were clueless. Meaning we, we got in business dealings with people. We had no business getting into it because every red flag was going off. And people in our lives were like, are you sure? Are you sure? Business with them? Like, that's, that, that seems a little shady. And you're like, your spider sense is like, ah, you know. You're like, oh, let's just go for it anyway. It's a good opportunity, right? Like Neville Chamberlain comes back from Berlin. And he's like, oh, that Hitler guy's amazing. He, he signed with me, promising he wasn't going to do any more damage. It's, that's great, right? Meanwhile, Hitler, ah, ha, 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 ha. And Winston Churchill was like, that guy has got crazy written all over him, right? He is, he is not to be trusted, right? So at times, we're clueless. And so we're going to experience bad things even when we're doing good just because we trusted the wrong people. Now, of course, for these, these Christians, things were just getting bad and getting, getting worse. And, and Peter acknowledges that. He knows that. He's doing this truism to him because I think it's cool that he's telling them, even though it's been bad, don't stop trust, trusting that it can get better. Don't get jaded. Still believe the general principle. Still believe good things can happen. Still believe that even, even if it's hard, it, there are better days could be coming. I love that he's telling these people whose lives are on fire, hey, come on, who's going to stop you if you do good? I know it's bad, but show up for work tomorrow with a good spirit. Believe for a better tomorrow. Come on, I, don't, let's not get jaded. Let's not get cynical. Let's not become snarky. Let's keep trusting people. Let's keep putting ourselves out there. Let's not let our hearts get hard. I love that. But even though they are literally an exception to the rule he's giving, he's still telling them, don't give up on the principle. Don't give up on, on what can happen. Let's still keep killing them with kindness. Let's, let's still keep pouring out some coals on their head. Right? Let's, let's show them some love. Let's, let's keep doing it. But then he acknowledges that they're going through it. So what does he say in verse 14? In verse 14, he says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you're still blessed. For e Because passion protects. So you're going through it, and it doesn't matter how much you're trying to love God and serve God, people are still bringing difficulty your way. People are still screwing you over. People are still being hostile. People are still being mean-spirited. But guess what? Even if you do suffer, you're still blessed. They can't take your blessing away from you. Even when it feels like all is lost, all is not lost. Why? 
because you're blessed. And they can't get at your blessings because it's not stored here on this planet, because it's not stored in a place where thieves can break in and steal. They can't take your blessing away because they didn't give your blessing to you. They can't take your value away because they didn't give your identity to you. If we allow people in our lives to be in a position to tell us who we are and to tell us what we're worth, then yeah, they can take it away. But as the book of Galatians says, if we're pleasers of God, we can't at the same time be pleasers of people. So he's saying, you're still blessed even if they come at you. People may try to destroy you, but they can't even really touch you because they don't even know the real you. And so what does he say? He says, quoting the prophet Isaiah, so don't fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. They can't actually destroy you when they come against you because you don't fear the same things they fear. Because Jesus taught us what to really fear. Didn't one day he tell his disciples, hey, guys, I don't want you to be afraid of people. And they were like, what? He goes, yeah, those people, because the Pharisees were walking by, and the disciples were very impressed by the Pharisees, their clout, right, their swagger, right? Pharisees be bringing the smoke, right? And the disciples were like, man, those guys, those guys are a big deal. He's like, for them, don't be afraid of people. All they can do, all people can do is kill your body. And the disciples at first were like, yeah, that's actually what we're afraid of. Um, <laughs> what are you talking about? And he goes, they can't get at your soul. They can't get at your real you. You should fear God. He says, he says, no one can take your blessing away from you. If you're zealous for what is good, nine times out of 10, it's not going to harm you. But even if they do harm you, they can't actually destroy you. They can't get to your real you. You're still blessed, no matter whether it's up or down, whether you're prospering today or you're, it's, 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 it's just like every single time. You're like, this, this is bad luck. What the heck? He says, because you don't fear the same things they fear. Isn't it? From the lyrics of Amazing Grace, it's my favorite line. He says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." A lot of times, we fear the wrong things, and we don't fear the right thing. But y'all, I came here on a Sunday night to tell you, if you fear God, you don't have to fear anybody else. Yeah. Grace. grace. Grace will teach your, your heart to fear God. And your fear of God, the grace and the majesty will cause you to stop fearing man and to stop just caring about Instagram followers and stop caring about whether your friend tagged you in that photo or they picked the one where they looked good and you looked bad. Yeah, we all got that friend, right? Or you, you, you'll stop caring so much just about dollars and pace, pace. I almost said pesos. Stop <laughs> to the Mexican audience listening. Ay, 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 ay right? <laughs> I would say this. When we, when we care more about God than we do about life on this earth, that's where grace has, has relieved our fears and taught our heart to fear. Passion protects. People try to destroy you, but they can't even touch you. Order is everything. The order is everything. God tells us what to do. God tells us how to follow him. God tells us how to arrange our life. And we don't have to worry about the hard things that come. We don't have to worry at all. I like how the Amplified translation puts it in verse 14. I think we have it on the screen. It says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, and then I love in brackets, it's implied, though it is not certain that you will. Amen. Even if you, you should suffer, but it's not certain that you will. Most of the things we worry about never even happen. Come on, it's not certain that you will. So let's stop worrying. Let's trust that God is in charge. Come on, it's, even if it does happen, but it's not certain that it will. So let's not act like we live perpetually under a rain cloud that's going to follow us around, just assuming that, that there's something hard. Come on, let's believe for the best. Let's trust that God's gone before us. Let's, let's believe that even when there's no way, he can make a way, because he is the way. I love that. Though it's not certain that you will. Oh, I was reading a verse. <laughs> You're still blessed. And in case you don't know what that means, it's happy to be admired and to be favored by God. Come on, that's your story. That's how God sees you. That's how you need to see yourself. Come on, look in the mirror tomorrow morning and say, blessed, favored, happy. But I just got to let go. Blessed, favored, happy, called, appointed, anointed. But your best friend won't return your text. They are ghosting you. Filled with the Holy Spirit, I've been ghosted in all the right ways. That's in my list of sermons to preach. My new Holy 
Spirit series coming 2023. Ghosted. I don't know if I'll ever get to it, but you heard it here, folks. Kids won't even be saying that anymore. I'll have missed my moment. Genesis 50, verse 20. At the end of Joseph's life, after he had been betrayed by his brothers, can you relate to that? Family drama? Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. Let that sink in. So if you're like Joseph and you've been betrayed by family, if you're like Jesus and your, your family doesn't believe in you, you're in good company. And yet, Joseph never let his spirit get bitter. I'm going to show you how. He never allowed there to be a vindictive, oh, when I'm in charge, I'll really make them pay. They're going to pay for what they've done to me. Kind of that, you weren't with me in the gutter, so you're not going to be with me in the penthouse kind of spirit, right? If you, if you didn't believe in me then, you know, they're not going to be on the gravy train later, right? Don't, don't, even, don't even call when things are good, right? That's, there's not a trace of that in him. He was actually in a position to take his brothers out. Instead, Genesis 50, 20, he says to them, to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In God had a plan. His order was everything. Joseph believed even as he was being sold to slave traders. Joseph believed even when he was being lied about by Potiphar's wife. Joseph believed even when he was in the dungeon being forgotten about by the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. Joseph believed that God had an order, that God had a plan, that God had a sequence. This was just an ingredient. This was just a step. He refused to eat the chicken before it was cooked. He believed it was going to be beautiful in its time. He, he wasn't in a rush. He wasn't hurrying God up, going, God, where are you now? What, where are you doing now? God, what, what's going on? Why, why, why? He's like, you know what? If I'm here, I'm going to be a blessing. If I'm here, I'm going to be zealous for good. If I'm in a prison, I'm going to bless the prison. I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm where I am today, so I'm going to be a blessing currently. I'm going to. In order. God, God, God did it in order. The order, the order, the order had a purpose. The order had a purpose. The order had a finished final product that was going to be the outcome of this formula in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. You see, on Joseph's worst day, he believed for this day. He believed there was a purpose to his pain. He believed that God doesn't ever waste a trial. He believed that in every dark day, he just said to himself, this is just a step. This is just a step. This is just a chapter. This ain't my story. This is just a, a chapter. Potiphar's wife, you don't get to write my story. God's writing my story. The order is everything. I'm going to turn a page. Don't mind me. I'm just going to turn a page. I'm just, I'm just going to believe this is just a day in my life. This ain't my whole story. You and I are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And we can fear the right things, and we don't have to fear any other things. We're blessed. Joseph was blessed in the pit, blessed in the prison. He was blessed when he was forgotten. And on this day, he looked back and saw that God had a plan on all those other days. And so he was able to be sweet and loving to those who were the cruelest to him. I mean, don't, let's not forget what we're a part of. This whole church thing, this whole gospel thing, it all got started when someone innocent died because some guilty people were about to go loose. So none of this makes any sense. And it's all slanted in our favor. In fact, in verse 18, if you read 1 Peter 3 that far, it says, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. The point is, someone should be slamming a gavel down going, order in the court. This is not right. This is not how it should be. And he's going, I'm doing it anyway. I'm dying. I know I'm, un I'm righteous. And I know these unrighteous people don't even, don't even have a Godward thought yet. They're by nature children of wrath. But I'm going to die for them. Why? To bring you to God. Peter's like, don't forget. He died for you to bring you to God. So, so I know you sometimes are like, oh, my day's going bad. You're still blessed. You're still blessed. The only innocent person who ever lived died for you. That's your story. Was headed to hell. Alive. What? 
had no chance of saving myself. Your story is you were dead, now you're alive. So come on, somebody. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. None of this, none of this story of my life every time something bad goes, goes down. Oh, story of my life, Murphy's Law. Oh, I should have figured it. Are you kidding me? The only righteous one to ever live died to save you, to bring you to God. There's value in you. There's a calling on your life. Don't you dare treat yourself worse than how God treats you. You got to start seeing yourself as valuable, because that's what you are to him. I was going to preach, Chris, about how being a follower of Jesus is kind of like being Black Panther and having vibranium covering you head to toe. Because it doesn't matter what gets shot at you, your suit's like absorbed, absorbed, absorbed. <laughs> Forgiveness and grace. <laughs> but I don't think they get that. So I didn't put it in the talk. My second point, I said there was two, right? First was what? Passion protects. Second point, adoration prepares. He says in the text, we should live continually prepared to give an account for the faith and the hope that lies within us. Live your life in this world where, as you do good, who's going to harm you? But even if they do, you're still blessed. How gangster is that, by the way? You didn't give it to me, so you can't take it from me. But as you do that, be continually ready, prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. This harkens back to the living hope, by the way that we began First Peter with. He started with living hope. Now he's like, oh, and by the way, while you walk around with this living hope in you and you're doing good constantly, there's probably going to be opportunities where you're going to get to talk to people about that living hope because they're going to ask you about it. And when that happens, be ready. Be prepared. But God told me to tell you that you can't be prepared if you won't prepare. This is the part of the sermon where you're like, OK. Oh my gosh, you're right. I need to get apologetics arguments and memorize them. I need to read Joshua McDowell's More Than a Carpenter and Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. I probably need to get me some Ravi Zacharias books, and I'm going to memorize them. And I'm, you, you show me to the nearest atheist, and I'll be like, kabam! <laughs> Resurrection theology, y'all, right? That, that's only less like hyper stance, like probably less like lunge status, right? But I did leg day, so I'm good. I got it, right? This is the part of the sermon, because I've heard 100 sermons where the pastors are like, don't be prepared to give a defense. You're like, OK. And you're like memorizing arguments when they say this. Like, literally, I've been in like, classes where they told you, if someone says this, here's how you hit them. You hit them with that. It's going to be salty, right? But the only problem with that is that I've never met a single person who's been argued into the kingdom of God. Not one. My friend Louis Giglio likes to, likes to say, that um, no one wants to watch the sunrise with a meteorologist. Yeah. You're like, wow, that's beautiful the color. She's like, well, let me tell you how that happened. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually the light. If you, if you notice over here, it's, it's really it's not actually orange. Mm, it just appears to be orange. <laughs> You're like, uh, that may be true, but ugh. <laughs> let me just, just give me a second. Just give me a minute to go, wow. Because it was dark, but dawn came. Because it was cold, but now, now the sun's on my face. Because I, I felt scared and alone and hopeless, but now I realize the sun just showed up. Because there's an order to this universe. And guess what? That order is everything. Because as that sun shows up, I'm reminded that I got new mercies and I got compassions that fill not. I could, I could get back in the round, another, another ring, another round. And that experience is what he's referring to when he says, just before telling us to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, he says, so make sure you adore Christ. Or our translation that we read out of the NIV, if you're wondering what version we're reading from, he said in verse 15, in your hearts, set Jesus apart as Lord. Make sure that every day you've put Jesus at the top of everything in your heart, seeking first the kingdom of God. One translation says, make sure you're getting your worship right. Worship, worship, worship. As you adore Jesus, it's adoration that leads to a state of continual preparation. And that has to be in the continual present tense. You can't be like someone's like, OK, what's, what's, what's with you? Even when I'm mean to you, you're cool. Even when, even when I lied about you and took credit for what you did, you still kept showing up with a sweet spirit. What's different about you? You're like, all right. I went to a Promise Keepers event in 1987. <laughs> and that was amazing. 
Come on, what have you, what, have, what, have, what has God done for you lately? What has he done for you today? I'm telling you, there's got to be a stirred up adder. Man, well, let me tell you, this morning I was spending time with God. I was watching the sun. I was having a cup of coffee. I was reading this verse. Here's what Jesus spoke to me. And this is the blessing that he's given to me. And this is the empty tomb. And that's what everything hangs on. It's, it's what he's done. Right? Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Let there be a continual refreshing of your devotion. And that's going to lead to you being continually ready to give an account for that living hope. Here's what God's speaking to me right now. Here's what I'm learning right now. Here's what he's showing. Because <laughs> there's nothing worse. Remember in high school when we had to give like oral book reports? There was nothing worse than trying to fake your way through telling someone about a book you hadn't read. I still can't enjoy The Great Gatsby. Because I remember standing there being like, well, you know, the plot was very thick. <laughs> and Whew, the character development was so good, right? The character development. She's like, yeah, but uh, who's so-and-so? And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> don't actually know that. ruby dooby doo right? Youngovich, right? It's like, these are not the droids you're looking for. I, I, I get cold chills just thinking about it. I don't care if Leonardo DiCaprio updated it. I can't enjoy it, right? Because I'd never read it. I couldn't talk about it. Don't let that be your faith experience. Keep your walk with God always in the present tense. Walk with him. Spend time with him. Worship him. Put him above everything else. One of my favorite things to do is in the morning time, just at some point in, in my morning time with Jesus, to raise my hands up and go, I praise you. I worship you. I'll, 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 I'll love you as long as I live. If you never did another thing for me, I will worship you. Because you're my God. You're my king. Jesus is king. There's an order to everything. Jesus before Levi. Jesus before you. That's the formula for power. That's the formula for you're on your toes to tell someone about Jesus. Because man, I, I put Jesus to the top of the flagpole in my heart this very morning. And as you're sharing that hope, as you now have from adoration a state of preparation in which to tell them about Jesus, and, there's, and I'm not belittling apologetics. If you're looking, like if you love that stuff, that's awesome. It's great. There's, there's, there's a place for that, sitting down and having those talks, right? If you're looking for a book to read, I highly recommend uh, Frank Turek and Norman Geisler co-wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist that I found absolutely fascinating. All the other ones I mentioned, really great. I've, I've had the chance to meet uh, Joshua McDowell and Lee Strobel and Ravi Zacharias, and they're all brilliant. Any of those books are great. You read them, they'll, give, they'll build up your faith. But I'm just saying, let it be about your relationship with God and not just facts that you've read. Because I think the problem with the argument thing and that you're going to say this and I'm going to say that thing is, is it really comes down to this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so as you're talking about what God's done in your life and you're able to share some of the things that you're, you're reading, you'll be doing so with gentleness and respect. Gentleness, that's what he said. As you tell them about the hope you have, make sure it's with gentleness and respect. So, so let me just make sure I'm doing the same thing. If you're here and even using the word atheist, or you know, if that's how you identify, or you would say, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic, I don't really know where I, where I stand with all that, thank you for being here. Thank you. If, if, you're, if you have questions on the faith journey, if you don't know where you stand, I, I respect so much that you would come into our church or watch this on your YouTube feed or Facebook and listen to me talk about a Jesus who saved my soul, who saved me from emptiness and from a, a life of narcissism and constantly trying to achieve to have value and to realize that I'm just a son of the king and that Christ shed his blood for me. And that's what's given me value and strength and had rescued me from despair and from hopelessness and from anxiety. And, and I, I believe the same thing can be true for you. I would, I would hope that we would live a life of gentleness and respect. And, and when we get it wrong, that we would maintain a clear conscience through confession. And we would own our mistakes. And people would say, well, you did this. Like, you're right. That was really lame of me. And I'm sure, especially as a Jesus follower, you're probably especially like put off by that hypocrisy. I know better. Shouldn't have done it. I'll work harder to do it. But I'm sorry. And then we get to use that good apology formula we learned early, where it's not like, but you also happen to be horrendous, right? <laughs> even if they are. <laughs> order. Order is everything. When you don't do things in the right order, things get out of order. But that's also true when it comes to us not following orders. We've been given orders. When we don't follow the orders, things end up out of order. And Peter, who wrote this book that bears his name, Learn this the hard way. 
Worship team, come on up here. We're about, we're about done. Um, the man Peter was so funny and complicated. We said at the beginning of the series, he was a bundle of contradictions, a bundle of contradictions, because he was the first to ever be called blessed by Jesus, but he was also the first to deny Jesus. And for him, order and ranking and status was so, so important. One time, him and John asked Jesus if they could sit at his right hand. And no, actually, it was James and John who asked if they could sit at his right hand and left hand. And, and I think that just gave us a little glimpse into the competitive nature of the disciples. There's just, they were like angling for position. And you know what frustrated Peter? So you know, I think, I think Peter like, decided like, any chance he got, he was going to be better than John after John did that. I'm, you, want, you want to sit where? You're not sitting in no one's right hand, bro. Right? You even see this show up on Easter Sunday. This is a tiny little story, and we're not going to go there. But the Bible says that the women reported to the disciples, Jesus has risen, the grave is empty. John writes, so once they told us that, me and Peter ran to the tomb, and I won. <laughs> you guys, please don't make it about that. Like, that, how human is the gospel? This is just one of those things that's like, this was not made up. No one would put that in there. Why is it written like that? That's how it happened. God wasn't happy with it. No, he says that disciple that Jesus loved outran Peter, right? It's like, what the heck? But Peter, Peter had his own moments like that, too. Jesus is like, hey, just so you know, you're going to deny me, and you're going to betray me. And Jesus was, Peter goes, not me, Lord. Not, not me, Lord? Yeah, you don't, know, you don't know how great I am. I'm actually pretty good. I'll never deny you, because I love you so much. And Jesus is like, fool, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And before that chapter's over, he has already denied him three times. That's because we were never meant to stand on the strength of our love for God. We were meant to stand on the strength of his love for us. First John puts it this way, we love him because he first loved us. And that's why the basis of Peter's restoration was all about love. You think you're, you're going to live on this great strength of love you have for me? Come on, buddy. It's all about my love for you. Peter got it. Peter got it. And here he is giving us a, an order, a framework, a grid, a sequence to live our lives by, things that he learned the hard way. But he also had his good moments with order. He also had his good moments with orders and following them. Like the time that he saw Jesus walking on water, that's a great day. That's a great day. And he saw him. He was so inspired with faith. He said, look at it. He said, if it's you, command, or I guess you could say, give me the order. Orders are everything. If it's you, really, then command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Gave him the order. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to get to Jesus. I know we like to throw shade on Peter, like, oh, cutting the ears off and stuff. Oh, putting your foot in your mouth and stuff. Come on, he walked on water, y'all. Why? Because he was under orders. And the orders are everything. And you're like, all right, that sounds great. So what are our orders? What are our orders? Everything. Everything. Right, right there. The orders, what are they? The order is? Oh, it's over here. The order is everything is the order. Everything is the order. What, what, what do I mean? I mean everything you're currently facing that you wish would go away. That's the order. It was arranged. This day is a part of that eventual day. This day right here. I know you wish you would go away. I know you, you wish, you're like, I would worship God if I was. No, 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 listen. You're here right now for a reason. You're here right now for a purpose. You're dealing with what you're dealing with right now under orders. It's not like if I had a better job, if I had a different promotion. The hardship is a part of God's plan for you. It's, and so what do you do? In everything, in everything, Paul says. Look at it on the screen. In everything you're dealing with, don't be anxious, but with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In everything, in everything. It couldn't have gotten to you if it didn't go through him. So right now in your situation, I dare you to jump up on your feet and praise him. Right now, I dare you to jump up on your feet and don't be anxious about what you're going through. I know you're tempted to go, just God, make it stop. But instead say, God, use me here. 
now. In the midst of your orders, God, I'm available. I am ready. I'm going to show your love. God, give me grace and compassion to give it out. God, help me to love the unlovable in my life. God, God, use me right here, right now. Not in a different job, not in a different city, not in a different marriage, not with a different family, not with a different car. God, right in the midst of this situation, I'm going to praise you. Come on, let's sing it out. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this message on the First Life YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Come on, be a part of what's happening on a more consistent basis. Consider who you possibly could share this message with, someone in need of a little hope. And if God would put it on your heart to support the ministry financially, we would so appreciate the partnership. Well, have an amazing day and we'll see you soon.